And the problem is because of the way our attention suddenly shifted at the point that Russia invaded Ukraine, the narrative, which was collapsing, you know, the public health authorities effectively got everything in verse. They gave us the inverse of the right advice for two years. Brett and Heather are evolutionary biologists and professors by trade, but they're probably most known for their recent book, The Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, which is a phenomenal book, and also Brett's many appearances on the Joe Rogan Experience, where he just uses the faculties of his intellect to sort out a lot of problems with a lot of the data, information, and the putting together pieces of a puzzle, which an intellectual of Brett's capacity is capable of doing. This is a wide-ranging podcast, and it was just beautiful to interact with both Brett and Heather, whose intellectual machinery are operating at such a high level. I think you guys are going to love this show. Also, in case you guys haven't heard, we're launching a premium podcast, which is going to include a monthly AMA episode only for the premium podcast on Supercast. Also, all kinds of unreleased guided meditations, guided breath works, guided ecstatic dances, whatever we can put on there that we can support you and thank you for supporting us on our podcast, our ability to have the best tech, the best studio, the best guests that we can fly out and really try to bring this to the ultimate level of what it's capable. So first of all, just want to say thank you for listening in the first place. And if you want to go to that next level, get more from me and contribute to the podcast in a more significant way, check it out, aubreymarcuspodcast.supercast.com. Once again, aubreymarcuspodcast.supercast.com. And the bonus is you'll never hear me read another ad about anything else ever again. The truth is, is that we're all the master, we're all the healer, we're all the mystic. Give it up one time for Aubrey Marcus. Brett and Heather, really looking forward to this conversation. We are too. Thank you for having us. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So I wanted to start with a quote from your book. And the quote is, Our species' pace of change now outstrips our ability to adapt. We are generating problems at a new and accelerating rate, and it is making us sick, physically, psychologically, socially, and environmentally. If we don't figure out how to grapple with the problem of accelerating novelty, humanity will perish, a victim of its success. So we've talked about this on the podcast, Daniel Schmachtenberger, some different people talking about the various existential threats that we're facing. But what I wanted to ask you guys as a way to start, and I wanted to ask each of you separately, is if you were to summarize everything that we're experiencing with the most significant single meta crisis that we're experiencing, and if you had to, I know it's, it could be hard. Maybe you have a top three or something like that. But if you said like the single meta crisis that we're experiencing from your perspective, what would that be? Wow. You want to go first? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm glad you put it in the, in the framework of meta crisis because it's very easy to point to crises. You know, I've got a long list of crises that I think all tell the same tale. And so it really is the meta crisis. It's the it's the thing that creates all of these, you know, uh, Fukushima, the Deepwater Horizon, the Elizo Canyon disaster, the financial crisis of two thousand eight, COVID nineteen. All of these things are really generated by the same phenomenon. And you know, we can get into some detail about what that phenomenon is and why it creates these crises. But the the hallmark, the way you can recognize that, yep, it's time to add another one to the list is that you discover that humanity is doing something that you didn't know about until after the disaster has already happened, right? Who knew Mm -hmm. what a credit default swap was before the financial crisis, right? Who knew that we were uh, pressurizing old oil deposits with natural gas before Elizo Canyon? Who knew that we were drilling wells in the bottom of the ocean so deep that we couldn't plug them uh, if the blowout preventer failed, right? These are all... um, 
discoveries that we make too late. And, you know, just to complete the list, you know, who knew uh, that nuclear power plants uh, required absolutely constant vigilance and that the disruption of the diesel generator backups created nearly instant um, meltdowns? And who knew that we were enhancing mm -hmm. viruses that would have had a very difficult time infecting human beings and turning them into absolutely diabolical pathogens? These are all discoveries that we made once the horses were out of the barn. And so the question is, what exactly has happened here on planet Earth that that is now uh, a phenomenon that has cur occurred, you know, six, seven, eight times uh, in the last couple decades? Hmm. Well, um, mm. I don't know if you want to respond to that, but I before I respond. Well, you know, certainly I think there's a lot more to be said there, and I definitely either bracket that and move over to your answer, or if you'd like to, Brett, you know, continue and describe and flush out what that meta crisis actually is, because it's a meta crisis of seems like both tr like truth and transparency, v vigilance common sense. I mean, there's a lot of things that I could point to there that might be it, but I think you could probably condense that into something that uh, is a little bit more palatable. Sure. Um, what we've done is we've plugged a bunch of systems into each other in ways that uh, our protections don't anticipate. So uh, we human beings, it turns out, are biological critters. Speaking of biological critters, <laughs> a cat has just landed on the desk here, but all, all biological critters are programmed in some sense by selection to look for untapped opportunities, right? And we mm -hmm. human beings do this in a way that's special. We're uniquely conscious and, and somewhat obsessed with the little annoyances in our lives where something could be done more efficiently. And in any case, that bent has been a key to human success because human beings, by virtue of our ability to exchange I abstract ideas through language, can team up and we can solve really difficult technical problems and come up with solutions that really are liberating. But the problem is we don't know when the problem that we are pointing ourselves towards has a solution that isn't worth the risk. This is especially mm -hmm. bad when the risks are particularly delayed, right? So nuclear power, for example, that is to say uranium-based nuclear power, can look exceedingly green, right? It looks like a very clean technology, but the point mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that's because the spilling of the nuclear waste into the environment is a rare circumstance that is very intense when it occurs, right? So we don't anticipate it. And basically, even if nine people out of 10 would look at the prospects of making nuclear power safe enough and conclude, actually, probably it can't be done, it only takes the one out of 10 who says, actually, I don't see the big deal. I think we can manage this to ensure that we have a world with, you know, as it currently stands, something like 400 civilian nuclear reactors, all of which depend on constant vigilance. And, you know, I, I would point people, that, that's a, that was a harder argument to make a few weeks ago, right? Once sure. the Russians started shooting at the largest reactor in Europe, it became obvious that building such a thing was a vulnerability because effectively what you've done is you've put a nuclear bomb on your own territory waiting for an enemy to decide it's in their interest to blow it up. Now, the Russians were smart mm -hmm. enough not to do it in this case, but how long before you run up against an enemy who isn't smart enough? Right, right. So then if you had to say, what is this, what is this fundamental, what is the fundamental drive then? Is it a drive towards, is this, is this basically the marshmallow experiment where people are looking for short-term profitability, short-term solutions for their own greed and personal gain, but not looking at the long-term consequences and delayed gratification of having a better world for themselves and everybody else? I mean, what is, what's going on? Somehow there's a failure in our, in our biological you know, logic that's, that's happening here, right? If, if I may jump in, <clears throat> you, the first part of your answer, I thought that what I had written down was exactly what you were talking about. And I think as you expand on it, I'm actually hearing something slightly different. Um, so if I, if I may try to, sure. ex try to answer what I think in a word your uh, meta crisis is, and then add my own, uh, which of course they're all, they're all entangled with one another in, in, yep. you know, for both better mm -hmm. and for worse. Um, 
it, the problem is evolutionary one, um, but I think uh, at its at its most uh, pristine, what you're talking about is the problem of reductionism, the problem of not uh, of not seeing complex systems and understanding complex systems for what they are, and instead taking individually uh, easily measurable things, things that are quantifiable, things uh, that can be basically debased into metrics, and then the human tendency, which will be the tendency of anything that does um, conscious work like humans do, is to imagine that what you've measured is the whole, and to take that easily measured thing, which is also analogous to the short time horizon as the bigger, more mm. complex thing, which is itself mm. analogous to the longer time horizon. And I'll just segue from that. And you know, this, of course, is a, is a theme that we explore throughout the book as well, the problem of metrics, the problem mm -hmm. of reductionism. Um, and the, the answer that I came up with as you started talking, um, as you first asked the question, Aubrey, was that we're outsourcing our thinking to authorities and to systems. That you know that we are mm. we are not relying on our own individual analytics and integrity to come to our own conclusions. And that sounds, I think, um, that could sound like a very naive answer because in a world as complex as that of the 21st century in which we are all benefiting from so many systems that we can't possibly understand even most of the systems that we are individually dependent on, how is it that I could be arguing for something in which there is no set and forget, in which we do understand everything? We can't. Um, but so, you know, is there an answer to the problem of all of us are outsourcing too many things and then we are more easily led astray because we're not accustomed to relying on our own intellect and intuition and creativity analysis. And I think there is. Um, it's doable. Uh, and I, I think uh, that we were actually doing this for many, many years as educators through truly personalized and sort of bespoke education in which you engage students. And you know, this doesn't, you can't teach a thousand students at a time this way, but you engage students as the individuals that they are, recognizing that almost everyone has capacity and everyone comes with individual baggage and thus has ideas about, oh, I can't do math, oh, I can't remember names, oh, I'm not good at this, that, or the other. But you get to know them a little bit and as soon as they can recognize that when you push back on something that they say, or you say, or anyone says, that you're not inherently pushing back on them as a human being, then you start pushing back. And you say, no, I don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. Here's why. No, that's not yeah. right. And boy, do you level people up really, really quickly. And once people have been leveled up this way, they have a taste for it. They want it. They mm -hmm. never again want to just be able to open the paper and say, well, if it says so, I guess it's true. <clears throat> and you know, it does take more work, and it takes more time. And you know, it isn't the the asleep way can feel like a kind of meditation, but it's not. It's it's a very you know rough sleep that actually brings with it no peace. And being able to and being driven to actually do the analysis for yourself, or being able to at any moment, uh, brings with it a much deeper sense of you know what. As much as I know I can't control a bunch of this, I can assess it at a level or I've come to understand how to figure out who else can assess it and who I can put my trust in such that I can actually come to know some of what's going on. And I think had we had um, those kinds of educational systems in place, um, many more of us would have been aware of things like Deepwater Horizon, the potential for Deepwater Horizon, the potential for Fukushima, the potential for SARS-CoV-2, the potential for yeah. the responses to SARS-CoV-2 um, than almost any of us did. So I want to I want to add two other things if I can. Please, um, please. So the, the cent central theme of our book is hyper novelty, which you hinted at here, which is really, in some sense, a related rates problem, right? It's not that human beings can't adapt to novel circumstances, even if they're complex. It's that the rate at which we are producing these circumstances is greater than the rate at which we are learning to manage them. And that's a problem uh, that has only spiraled out of control as the number of different topics on which we are making progress, which as Heather points out, we individuals are not in a good position to, to even know what risks we're facing. That you know, we have uh, we have compounded the issue with sort of you know a complex interaction of complex problems, um, but 
there is a secondary issue, which is that the game theory that uh, unfolds around our system, because the engine of our system is competitive, which is not new, that is an evolutionary engine that has been upgraded with economic tools, but because that is the engine, what it does is it sets up a situation in which people who can figure out how to profit, even as they put us at risk, tend to be rewarded by the system, even if the risks don't justify uh, the profits that they made. And so what we have is a system in which effectively capture evolves, right? Mm. And so all of the systems that you might use, yes, I, I can't, maybe maybe I don't have the tools to interpret the hazards that surround nuclear power or gain of function research or something like this, but I should be able to proxy to somebody who does have those tools. And the problem is when almost anybody that you would proxy to has been captured by a system that has a perverse incentive, then you may do the right thing, which is to say, well, I don't know this topic, but that person does. But if that person is um, blinding themselves to a hazard because that's how they're gonna end up with a second home, then that that problem results in us continually facing these self-inflicted wounds. Yeah, it's it seems like, you know, in a in a well-functioning culture and society, you do rely on good faith actors and then good faith watchdogs of those good faith actors. So the media acting is in good faith watching other people who are trying to act in good faith and then the system, you know, you kind of get checks and balances, but what we have is is now people like yourselves who have just taken an intelligent interest in circumstances surrounding something like COVID, let's say and are just analyzing the data and the facts that are coming out and just talking about it and presenting it. And all of a sudden, you know, you're one of the sanest voices throughout this pandemic, right? And it's like, this shouldn't be the way it, I mean, it, I'm grateful that you guys are doing it, but it's actually hinting at, like you said, this massive dysfunction in both the actors themselves who are just worried about that next election cycle or that next quarterly, you know, finance <coughs> board meeting release or whatever, whatever is that thing is, everybody's just beholden to the next little milestone. And then all of the media and everything is all, is all captured, as you said, by advertisement and the, all of the ways in which all of these things are influenced. And so we have a very broken system, which is now putting the onus back on regular individuals who just want to look at things with a sober context to start sounding alarms and raising interest. And fortunately, we have the media mechanism of podcasts, which has still been you know, relatively untouched by censorship, that we can actually start to get some of these conversations out. Um, but it's certainly not the world that we hoped it was and that we believed it was you know even i'm i'm only 41 but the world that i believed existed yeah. yeah i thought it was a little fucked up and a little corrupt in a little bit ways but now we're looking at it like come on like this is not this is not it and so now we have to take that burden it sounds like back on ourselves yeah <clears throat> no that's right and i think one of the things that um the covid pandemic has put in stark relief for a lot of people and many people are getting glimpses of it, but still can't quite believe it, is that for years, it's been increasingly clear, like everyone knows that, that politics corrupts people and that many politicians are corrupt. And increasingly people were coming to understand that uh, too much of the media was in lockstep with, uh, you know, either whoever was funding that particular newspaper or with, you know, outside invisible interests, right? And uh, in the last few years, increasingly, there was a lot of talk about the corruption in higher ed, but it was mostly focused on, it seemed to be focused on, you know, the humanities and the social sciences because of the, you know, the woke ideology, the diversity, equity, inclusion stuff, right? The postmodernist mm -hmm. um, in, infringement on, on good thought. But a lot of people, I think almost everyone, uh, imagined that science, because the scientific method is itself such a mm -hmm. remarkable process that the people doing science must still be clean, as it were, must still be actually doing science. And as, you know, as we've talked about many times in many places, not just on our podcast, in fact, by the mid to late 20th century, at least in the West, and specifically we know the best about the, the US, the funding of science meant that uh, the, the goodies that people are offered 
once they go into science in order to have a chance of making a name for themselves and having a career and being able to pay their mortgage puts you on a, a track, puts you on a line off of which you cannot veer. And so once you are doing that, once you are playing that game, you are forced to play more of that game. And it involves getting grants uh, from agencies that have their own political bent. And that is not a scientific situation at all, but it's exactly how almost all science is funded at this point. And so part of what we're seeing, you know, the, the, the falling apart of sense making in political space and in media space and in Hollywood space uh, is, is a shame and somewhat understandable to many people, but the idea that it's happening within science for exactly the same kinds of reasons, uh, and for for reasons that have been visible to those of us in science since you know we were we were in grad school in the 90s, it was visible. You could see it. You could see that many people who were earning degrees were already not asking questions for themselves. Were getting degrees, having worked under someone, were going to then. <clears throat> excuse me, um, come to do work that was not particularly novel, that was in keeping with what the granting agencies wanted um, to be asked, and that they would train the next generation exactly the same way. So this is um, not brand new, but is perhaps only in the last couple of years increasingly visible to people not within the framework of science. It's, you yeah. know, it, it's a four-alarm emergency, though. That, that's the, you know, yes, we can all talk about what's wrong with the system. People have done that for decades. But I think the point is, how wrong is it? And, you know, your, mm -hmm. your point about podcasts makes the case very clearly. Yeah. Should it fall to Heather and me to use our evolutionary toolkit to analyze COVID in real time on podcasts? Does that make sense as a way to navigate uh, a pandemic? No, that doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> the fact that we actually beat almost everyone in terms of predicting what was going to happen and that we gave far better advice than the CDC with respect to how to understand the pandemic and protect yourself, that we were ahead of them again and again and again, and that this all unfolded on podcasts that are not built for a technical audience at all, says something is so wrong with our core scientific system, our core set of watchdogs, our media, our environment, that this thing has been driven onto the fringe. That's where the only conversation that matters is happening because it has become impossible in the places that it is supposed to happen, right? That's mm -hmm. a four alarm fire. Yeah. Yep. And um, yeah. if we don't wrap our minds around it and say, well, what would have to, what would have to happen in order for us to have these conversations where they should happen? What would have to happen so that the experts stop giving us the inverse of good advice, right? Which is what they did throughout the pandemic. And, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a fun question, but uh, far better that we confront it now because the longer we leave it, the worse it gets. Yeah. And this idea of, of, these different agencies also being captured like supposedly the fda was supposed to be this independent arbiter of what was good science and not good science but then you start to look at how interwoven they are with pharmaceutical interests three of five of the last directors then taking significant equity compensated board seats with the pharmaceuticals and how all of this entanglement works you realize that the FDA isn't unbiased anymore, nor is the CDC with all of their grants and donations. And so you start to see how everything is being kind of captured by this economic model and these short-term incentives. And so, as you said, like this really is an incredibly challenging situation with lots of top-down psychological techniques and pressure to scapegoat, you know, any ideas that don't agree with the, with the consensus narrative. <clears throat> And it's created a very divisive and strange situation where, you know, finding out actual information and having real conversations without strange words being attached, like right wing conspiracy theorists or blah, blah, all of these things, you know, Grifter. racist, this, blah, blah. yeah, whatever, whatever it is, all of these words, to, again, trying to reduce something that's incredibly hyper novel as you say a human being you reduce them to a single tiny little label and then you think you can explain all of their arguments and the entirety of that human being with this little label and it's it's worked a little bit which is also alarming that these very crude propagandist kind of methodologies are also 
exacerbating the uncovery of like everybody going like whoa because that's kind of like you would hope that would happen from a from a population standpoint like whoa hey whoa okay we get it we get the game yeah. but still these these psychological mechanisms are still effective well we i think even as individuals we can both get the game and still fall prey to it right we can understand it analytically yeah. and still have the addiction you know whatever it is to to the quick fix to the quick diagnosis the quick diagnosis of another human being if it's another human being on social media for instance or the quick fix in the tr in the form of a pill which was generated by some public private partnership between you know academic scientists and and pharmaceutical scientists who were looking not for a cure for something but for something that can put the symptoms at bay long enough so that you feel good enough so that you'll buy the thing again so you know the market forces pre uh, you know produce precisely the short term time horizon that understanding a complex system isn't optimal for they they do that and it is also clear in the examples that you put forward that something whatever the mechanism you know i think it has to have been sophisticated and conscious but even if it was emergent something has set about making it expensive to listen to people who are making sense right mm -hmm. because if you you know if you listen to us you have to face the question you know of are you listening are you listening to grifters? Are you listening to people who are, you know, out of their depth? Are you listening to people who have an ax to grind? What exactly is this? And the answer is no, none of those things actually add up once you get to the material. You can see that it's not true, but you have to get past those stigmas in order to start listening. And, you know, once you get past the stigmas, you can begin to, you know, let's, let, here, here's the, the core. The work of figuring out how we should understand something like COVID and what we should do about it personally is actually easier than you would expect. COVID is incredibly complex, but there's a lot that you can do as you approach the puzzle, diminishing returns being what they are, right? So you could notice first vitamin D, right? And at yep. the point you've, you know, do you need to understand deeply how vitamin D functions in what way it is produced? No, you just need to understand that there is this basic, extremely strong connection between vitamin D deficiency and seasonal illness, right? And you need to understand that dietary supplementation is not sufficient for most of us who live in the temperate zones to make enough vitamin D. So we're almost all deficient. And once you realize that, and then you realize there's effectively no risk to vitamin D, then the point is, well, the obvious thing to do is to supplement. And the fact that the CDC never bothered to recommend that tells you that the CDC isn't any good at what the CDC is supposed to be good at. <laughs> so, you know, mm -hmm. now you're in a position to say, well, all right, are there any other, is there any other low hanging fruit? And the answer is, yep, there's a bunch of it. Yeah, that's one thing I think you guys have done a really good job of is, is trying to find these things that are just simple enough that people can understand it that'll expose that there's something beyond what they're being told and vitamin d is i've heard you guys kind of go back and forth and and talk about the different ones that you thought were really pertinent and that one is is really quite clear and you know also issues with masks you know and how the reversal recent reversal of those positions and the lifting of these mandates even though this you know COVID-19 is still spreading and all of a sudden they're acknowledging that cloth masks don't really do anything. And meanwhile, if you said that, you know, 18 months ago, you were getting deplatformed for it and fact checked and called a conspiracy theorist and all of this, all of this whole nonsense, but all of these things are happening. And then they're just happening. Like you're throwing something that feels like it should be this giant crash bang grenade you know like when the navy seals go into a house and it's a flashbang and there's a big light and a big explosion everybody's like whoa now we get it and all of a sudden they're like throwing it into a vacuum and you're we're waiting for the sound and we're not hearing we're not hearing it it's like the flashbang is a dud again we're like what <laughs> this one's a dud too no what way are the odds, right you know what are the yeah. odds yeah. Yeah. Totally. so it's uh <clears throat> um yeah it's changing though it feels like it's starting to shift a little bit like it feels like it's they're starting to more people are starting to perk up slowly not in that flashbang moment yeah. that you know I, I think we would all like to have seen but it's it's starting to happen i hope so i feel i think i think both brett and i sometimes synchronously and sometimes asynchronously throughout these last two years have had these moments of now it's got to happen right you know and i i the one that felt the most intense for me was at the point that 
um, the <clears throat> the boosters were released, and it was like, well, if they try to mandate boosters, people, a lot of people who were fully vaccinated are not going to go and get boosted, and um, that's going to be a breaking point for a lot of people. But you know, they stepped back and never mandated boosters for for the most part. You know, there there were there were local ones. But you know, one thing I wanted to say is, I would love to know who the really smart, insightful, deep thinking, and deeply trained vaccinologists and virologists and public health scientists are, whom whom I could be reading and listening to and taking mm. some more insight from. You know, we have never claimed to be expert in those, you know, those three things. What we are expert in is evolution and viruses evolve and um, this virus seems to have evolved differently from others. And, you know, we, we are expert in some regards in this space, but you know, there's a reason that we didn't go into any of those fields. It's not what we are particularly drawn to, and it's not an area that we claim to be expert expert in. So, you know, where obviously we live in a world in which we need actual experts in viruses and vaccines and public health, and there seems to be a remarkable vacuum. I would also add that yes, Things are changing, but there's a question about why they're changing now, and I think we are in danger of losing the most important question of all, right? When, when we started talking about this, um, what we said to each other was that the issues surrounding the virus origins, surrounding early treatment, and surrounding vaccine safety and efficacy reveal the problem of capture, right? It's almost impossible to understand without such examples just how deeply broken our system is and why, or maybe broken is the wrong term. Our, success, our system succeeds brilliantly at something that we do not understand to be its purpose, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is because of the way our attention suddenly shifted at the point that Russia invaded Ukraine, the narrative, which was collapsing, you know, the public health authorities effectively got everything in verse. They gave us the inverse of the right advice for two years. The reason right. for that is that was not, there's no level of ineptitude that gets you to the inverse of the right advice. You could get random advice through ineptitude, but you can't get the inverse of good advice, right? The inverse of good advice involves knowing what the right thing to do is and doing the opposite. And so we were about to get to a place where we were going to have a conversation. How is it that we were so poorly ser served by our governments at every scale, right? And we shifted topics, and it's like the squid disappearing into a burst of ink. And what I would say is we're all tired of COVID, right? Nobody's more tired of COVID than <laughs> Heather and me have been talking about it almost nonstop for two years. Yeah, yeah. But the... Uh, the key is that we not let the issue go until we finally understand what happened. Because what happened, the key to this never happening again, and you know, it could be a worse virus next time, or it could be a right. different topic that fails for the same reason. But the key to it not happening again is understanding the corruption of our system and the role that it plays in harming us. It seems to me that there's an issue that people have with acknowledging that they were wrong also you know and i think this plays this plays a part there's there's kind of two camps there's the people who are like yeah i've been telling y'all and they might just be kind of bored of it and it seems like and they may be just kind of letting off the get letting off the gas a little bit and saying like all right and, and you guys talk about the dangers of this idea of okay the mass mandates are lifted fine my in, my own personal inconvenience is being lifted and i can still mostly do what i want fine, fine, fine. So they, there's like boredom from the people who kind of got the idea. And that's one issue. And then another issue is people who are vehemently, vehemently arguing against all of this common sense, everything from vitamin D to ivermectin or whatever the issue was or masks, everybody kind of had their own sweet spot of what they were really kind of zeroed in on or vaccine safety and effect, efficacy. But they're now, it seems like so happy to just change the topic and why are we even talking about this anymore instead of going like damn like i'm i'm sorry like i was i was wrong and it seems like a fundamental kind of issue another meta crisis that we're experiencing where people just don't have the stomach and the courage to say 
hey, whoops, like I was really wrong. I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. Well, you know, like I really thought I was doing the best thing that I could and giving the best advice I could. And I really wanted to help the world. I wanted to make, you know, grandma and grandpa safe. And I was doing the best thing I could and, and I was wrong. But it seems like instead of taking that route, the easier, shinier object is just, ah, let's forget about that and not talk about it. Yeah. And, and put that in. And as you guys talk about, there's, there's reasons for everything, you know, like there's not things that there's a reason why this is. And so maybe I would just offer this to go back into your, your core of your academic research, right? And like where you come from as evolutionary biologists is where is this, where is this mechanism where we're so afraid to acknowledge like, Hey, I was wrong, you know, and, and why is that so hard for people in this in this day and age right now um it's a great question i do want to say that there is one silver lining here to the pandemic and the question of wrongness which is that all of us got something wrong right i've got yeah, a little list of, of things that i feel like damn i should have should have had that earlier or i got that wrong and we've been very good we've been very careful to go back and say hey we got this wrong and that wrong that's <clears> been one of the things we do um, but because everybody got some of it wrong, we can now compare those lists and people who got everything wrong, we can safely ignore them with respect to their <laughs> insight on, on future situations. And then within those who got a bunch of stuff, right, we can say, well, all right, how'd you do it? And, you know, compare notes and all of that. The answer to your question really is we have a collapse of the thing that would naturally create reasonable authority. Right, we've got a bunch of phonies. Now, I don't know if they know they're phonies. Presumably, some of them do. Many of them probably do not. But if your track record is you got it all wrong, then of course you don't want to admit that you got something wrong because then the point is, well, what'd you get right? And if you don't have anything to point to, then the answer is, then why are we listening to you? And why are we paying you? Right? And why are you on our screens? So, um, so there is. I, I think that the reluctance, all of the honest brokers. Uh, you will find are not afraid to talk about what they got wrong because they don't have everything uh -huh. to lose in it. Uh -huh. It, in fact, re reflects well on them. And it is certainly the case that for an honest audience, hearing somebody say, you know what? I got hydroxychloroquine wrong. I assumed it didn't work because that's what I was told by people I believed and then it turned out that it did, right? To hear that, okay, it says your model wasn't good enough to spot the error, but it says that when you do spot it, you don't, you know, pretend, right? So that actually elevates you. Unless you do that, you know, topic after topic and you're always getting it wrong, when you get things wrong rarely and you correct it, the point is the audience actually increases its trust in you, so it's good. And so the answer to your question then is, isn't it interesting that there is this avoidance of uh, that analysis? Doesn't that suggest that basically you have... Uh, you know, a, a whole cadre of experts who aren't experts at all, and therefore they must avoid that question because it reflects very badly on them. I'm I'm reminded of a story we tell in the book. Um, the book, which is uh, for those who haven't read it, it has almost nothing to do with COVID. In fact, we submitted the first complete draft just as COVID was beginning to emerge into people's consciousness in the world. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> early March of 2020. And we went back and added a few things in, and actually the couple of things we added in are a couple of things we got wrong. We were talking about masks, for instance. Um, but one of the stories in actually the medicine chapter is we go back and we look at what um, a, a considerable, I don't think it was mainstream, but a considerable branch of uh, medical thinking in the early 20th century was that, uh, well, uh, the large co the large intestine, the colon, doesn't seem to do any good, so why don't we just get rid of it? And so there are a number of these surgeries and a number of doctors and surgeons who were actively arguing uh, for and actively doing uh, these surgeries. They're just removing people's large intestines because they figured that was... Um, that was something that, uh, that, that should be done and was valuable. And of course, this, is, this, this sounds insane to people in 2022, right? I don't think you could say that to anyone in 2022 and have them go, yeah, that's probably right. But what we don't get from that story is, what did it feel like to live then? What did it feel like maybe to be one of those doctors, but more to the point, one of those patients or 
you know, a friend of one of those patients who came away from the doctor saying, oh, my doctor says I should have my large intestine removed. What does the friend at the coffee shop say? What does he think? And, you know, that's, that's the world we've been living in for the last two years. We've been getting advice from people who, as it turns out, either have no idea what they're doing or are actively misinforming us. And we're sitting around in coffee shops, most of us going, really? You said that? Well, He's the authority, I, I guess, but kind of doesn't sound right. And so, you know, one of the things I've been trying to figure out a lot during this is what actually do these historical moments feel like in the moment? It's really easy to think back on historical atrocities or even these things that most people don't know about, like, you know, the, the, the move to remove people's large intestines and go, ha, 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 isn't that obvious? How could you possibly have fallen for that? When the fact was, large numbers of people were falling for it. Well, large numbers of people were falling for this right now. And how how is it that we can reach people in the moment and say, you know what? There is no follow the science. You're following the mob. Like that's, you're, you're not the good guy here. This is not, you're right. not playing the role that you think you are, but how to reach people in that moment is is tough. And I, you know, I know that we have, I think all three of us here have, you know, have reached some people. But the question for me is always how to open up more people's hearts and minds, if you will, um, to be ready not to be part of the mob, because they don't think they're part of the mob. They're righteous. They think they're on the side of good and light and science somehow. Well, and yeah, they- A couple, uh, couple things come up real quick, real quick, Brett. Let me just yeah. talk about a couple of things sure. and I'll get right to you. One, what you're talking about with this large intestine is a perfect example of something you talk about in the book, which is the principle of Chesterton's fence, yeah. right? Like this idea that well, we don't know exactly what the large intestine does, but we're pretty sure that, yeah, we don't need it. Nature fucked up, you know, like yeah. all of these millions of years of, eh, fuck it. You know, yeah. let, let's take it out, right? But they didn't really get it. And we still don't get it. We understand a little bit. We're starting to under, understand like the importance of bifidobacteria and these different things that are found only in the large. We're starting to get it, but no, we still don't get it. We still don't understand the virome, the biome, the mycobiome. We don't understand this shit completely. So the idea that you can remove something, it's just the ultimate form of hubris. And this, again, reductionism that's reducing this hyper novel thing, a hyper novel human, and then the hyper novel functioning parts of a human, including organs, and saying like, eh, you know, whatever. Like we can just take that out. And so that's that's one thing I think is, is beautifully pointed out in your book. And we're, we're seeing that in this case, you know, especially with even something like all of these things that are happening, we're, we're reducing things too far and having too much, too much hubris and not enough respect for the fact that our body has been figuring this out in the most perfect way that a body knows how to figure it out without any bias at all, just figuring it out according to actual nature influencing it, giving it direct feedback, and then responding through the process of evolution and epigenetics and all of these things. So that's one thing, this is a massive amount of hubris. And then there's also like the, I think it's called the Semmelweis effect, right? The, from Ignis Semmelweis. Mm -hmm. And they actually made a, another term about this. And Ignis Semmelweis, for those of you who don't know, he was telling everybody in the OBGYN like, hey, if you wash your hands before delivering babies, less people are gonna die. And the medical establishment completely shunned him, ended up throwing him into a mental institution where he was beaten and then died ultimately of sepsis, <laughs> largely probably because people didn't wash their fucking hands. And then at the end, then at the end, everybody's like, oh, whoops, sorry. But what you're talking about is like, how about in the moment? Like, how about in the moment when they're like, when he's like, hey, let's look at this. Where are the people saying like, okay, hey, should we, should we listen to this guy? Yeah. Or, you know, or, or what's going on? Well, those, yeah. uh, those two examples uh, function very differently. And in some sense, you're underselling yeah. the, the issue on the, the large intestine because the basic point, the, the uh, argument that we deploy in the book is you're talking about an organ that carries a certain amount of risk and a tremendous amount of expense to build, right? If there's one thing you can be absolutely dead certain of, it's that it has a function, right? So unlike <laughs> Chesterton's fence, if you're walking down the road, uh, with your friend and you run into a gate across the road, then the question is, does it have a function or doesn't it? You know it originally did, but you don't know it currently does. Something mm. as large yep. as the large intestine clearly does. And so you don't need to know anything about what it does for you to know that it's functional, right? And you can see this because we've got an intermediate case with the appendix. The appendix is the same as the large intestine in the sense that it very definitely has a function, whether you know what it is or not but you can remove it safely. 
unlike the large intestine. Right? Why can you remove it safely? Because you're a modern person who has plenty of food. And so the role that it plays in repopulating your gut with good uh, gut flora so that you spend as little time without your symbionts after you've been sick as possible, that's not so necessary for you because you're not calorie limited or nutrient limited in the first place. Right? Or safe but, food limited mm -hmm. specifically. Right. But your ancestors were. Right. So anyway, the point is. Um, and, you know, I actually realized this about the appendix in college where, you know, what was it like to live in the world where people didn't know that your large intestine did anything? Well, we lived in a world where people didn't know your appendix did anything. Mm -hmm. And it was bewildering to those of us who understood anything about evolution because it couldn't possibly be as they described it, right? They described it as right. a vestigial organ in the process of disappearing. But, you know, with the number of people who experience appendicitis, with, uh, an appendicitis which would likely kill them if they didn't have a surgeon at their disposal, that's an immense cost for for an organ. People must be dropping dead of appendicitis on the savannah all the time. Right. Which, of course, doesn't happen. <laughs> um, so anyway, you know, when, you know, what does it say about your doctor if your doctor tells you that your large intestine uh, doesn't have a function? It says that your doctor hasn't thought at all about the way evolution works, right? Mm -hmm. And the problem right. is, uh, for reasons that are purely historical artifact, we teach medicine in a pre-Darwinian form, right? Mm -hmm. It should be that every medical school is riddled through with Darwinian thinking, but they are not. Right? We teach medicine as a non-evolutionary science. And so you can get doctors concluding insane things like the large intestine doesn't have a function, which, of course, you know, really? Well, then how did it get there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, right. And I also, I mean, in my own, I've obviously in the human optimization realm and in the ways in which I've explored in the building of the company on it and just exploring things and running some clinical trials on our supplements and trying to understand just a cursory knowledge of how things work. I also, and also my own explorations in psychedelic medicine and the understanding that energy is a real thing, that all of these people who were talking about chi and talking about prana, you know, weren't just completely woo woo nonsense idiots for thousands of years like there's something really there and i've felt it and i have a gnosis i have a gnosis of these things and it makes me then also wonder and and just how much more information is going to come out and i think you just have to have the humility to say hmm maybe so i don't really know you know i'm not deep into the science of water and how water could be alive or structured in these different ways but i can watch my cats and i know my cats like water that's freshly coming out of the faucet a lot more than water that's stale in a bowl and there and there's something about that that makes me wonder like maybe they know something about water maybe they know something about the energy of it maybe they know something about the energy of food and we can't just register it on all of our machines quite yet but maybe we should just open our mind to the possibility that there's going to be an overlay of an entire different systematic way that we look at everything that we intake and and let's see you know, let's see what let's see what ultimately happens. Let's start to put probes in and start to have some humility about, huh, maybe there's more to it. Maybe even with all of this debate about veganism or carnivore or whatever, maybe that's also a little reductionist. And we could start looking at the actual life force energy of the food that we're having that isn't easily measured in, you know, grams of protein and grams of fat and and different micronutrients. Like mm -hmm. like just opening the mind to the possibility that we haven't figured it out all all yet because of course we have it we never have and it's going to be a long fucking time until we approach that yeah and you know? and it, you know there there are like nested layers <clears throat> of understanding and each of them can contain truth and yet as you move to the next layer you may realize how much harm you did by understanding the one layer and um to wit the, the particular example you were just talking about you know we have thought that the you know a cat's preference for running versus still water is about still water i mean running water being more likely to be clean to be you know to be clear sure. of uh fungal and bacterial and viral contaminants and such and that may be it and there may well be more um but you know the germ mm -hmm. theory of disease from which that understanding emerges is absolutely you know has saved so many lives and is so important and antibiotics which emerge from the germ theory of disease is so freaking important at so many levels yep. and it was i don't know the eight, the 1980s or 90s before the idea that actually we contain multitudes you know at a microbiome level came to be understood and we still don't know 
we still don't know exactly as you say, but we have come to understand that actually just killing it all off is not going to be an, a successful approach to being a human. Yeah. And it was, again, the hubris of thinking, ah, we got it, germ theory of disease, antibiotics, we are there. Like we have arrived, we know what it is to know. And like, really? Uh -huh. Can you just, can you try to go back in history and imagine what it was to be at any of these other points and well, rather sure. than reading that as, oh, aren't we so smart now that we have that to look back on and laugh at those foolish people? It's like, no, we're, we're them too. And there will be people well, in the future yeah. who look back on us. And are you sure you wanna be part of the one who's, who's so certain now, are you sure? Because if you're that certain, you're probably wrong. We also need to be yeah. open to the way things actually work, right? Mm. And very often there's a simple explanation for something that may not be in the place that we're prone to look at it, but it, it may also not be something very fancy that we don't have the technology to understand yet either. And if I can give mm. a, an example or two, this example is a little bit grotesque, but it's funny enough to, to be worthwhile. Um, I did my first research gig in Jamaica, and there were all of these Jamaican kids who used to follow me around because I was from elsewhere and I had interesting stories to tell about what the rest of the world was like. And anyway, I got hiccups one day, and the Jamaicans said, oh, we got a cure for this. Said, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> um, and the cure involved you had to get a, a loogie on your tongue and then spit it into your hand, and then you took your finger and you took some of it and you painted an X on your forehead. Okay, <laughs> works beautifully, right? Every time, <laughs> never misses, right? Now, what they don't tell you is that the drawing the X on your forehead has nothing to do with it. You can stop at the point that you've put the loogie in your hand because that's the thing that does it. It's the exercising of this muscle that gets things firing in the right direction again. Uh -huh. The point is- So they mysterious. just have a little flirt. <laughs> Somebody was just laughing at the end. Oh, right. They knew that that no, works, it, and they were like, they were like totally, what a joke. Look, we're going to get this person to put that loogie on their face. On ex watch this. Exactly, Check out the gringo. exactly. But, you know, it's so it's so delightful. This is a perfectly mundane explanation, but there's a feint <laughs> built into the instruction set. Um, but, you know, we could take something like, um, you know, back when we were kids, there was a, a period in which, I kid you not, the New York Times and everybody else was busy discussing whether or not talking to your plants actually help them grow and it turns out it does right and so there was speculation about the co2 that you were exhaling was that good for your plant no of course not what's happening is that you're actually setting yourself the task of looking at your plant and talking to it like a creature <laughs> you're empathizing with it yeah. and so you're going to notice when it needs some water mm -hmm. and if oh, it's those not leaves look a little yellow let me figure out what to do to help yeah. that does it need nitrogen who knows right, right. Yeah. so right. there are lots of these explanations where there's something you know and i would argue you know i don't know how chi works but my guess is chi isn't a physical thing but it's a metaphorical thing and there's something about paying attention to the body as if there was this thing you know i could be wrong about this of course but the point is you have an ancient tradition it is a long it's long standing and expensive that tells you that it's functional but you don't know how it functions mm -hmm. and one very likely way is that it gets a person to pay attention to your physiology in a way that they have some you know it may be uh, you know that uh, the acupuncture uh, stimulates nerves in a way that contracts that breaks connections in your uh, your uh, connective tissue that have otherwise frozen system, you know, that would be analogous uh, to osteopathy, right? But that it isn't the flow of chi. It's something that if you think of it as the flow of chi and you behave in this way as if there were chi and as if you were interrupting it, it has these meaningful, measurable physiological effects that are positive. I think that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful way to really think about this is that the two parts of this one that these ideas can actually be understood in ways that make sense now and also just taking the premise that they've existed for a reason that they're expensive in time and, and occupation of the mind they're expensive they've existed for some adaptive reason and so let's just take that as like the the principal thesis of which we're going to operate and then understand how it might work but also even in your language just the open-mindedness to, yeah, maybe they were actually saying the exact thing. And we, you know, it's just, it, it requires both. Like, yeah, let's understand it to the best of our abilities right now. And then let's just be open to the possibility that new information will enlighten 
enlighten us in the future and we'll understand it in a deeper way or in a more nuanced way or even a slight shift in perspective. And and this is the, the fundamental idea, another meta crisis that we're experiencing is this idea that science is fixed. You know, like there's the science is fixed and it's, it's very, there's all these signs that you'll see around science is real. Well, of course, when someone is saying science is real, what they're really saying is believe what the news is telling you about science and take that as gospel. It's really a religious claim, not a claim about science, because of course science is real. You know, like, of course it is. But that's not what they're actually saying. What they're saying is it's a religious claim. It's like the same as putting a, one of the fish on your car and just announcing yourself as a Christian. You know, it's just like a identity politics type of thing is really what they're saying. But they're using terminology that make, that somewhat justify their case. And the case being that everything that we need to know about science is understood and good faith actors are presenting that information to the best of their ability without being captured and without bias. And it's just fucking not true. <laughs> it's just not true. Right. And even if they were, they might find out some new shit later. Yes. And and there's also even pressure within academia. I think when I was researching my book, I looked at a study that showed when the top acad- the top person in any academia, when they died, new citations with other different critical theories flourished and expanded like exponentially. But when they were in the dominant position, then there was far, far less, you know? And so it's like, sometimes it's just hard for things to change even within science, but it must, and it always does, and it always will. And so this idea that science is fixed and that we don't need to constantly be open to new ideas is just utter nonsense. It is. And th- I mean, there's there's utility no matter what field you're in, in being able to stand in at least two different places and, and to look at it from two different perspectives. I'm reminded specifically... Um, of an acupuncturist uh, whom, whom I have seen, actually, who has training. He himself is um, ethnic Chinese and has training in the Eastern tradition, but also training. Um, he has an MD from one of the top medical schools in the United States. And he practices acupuncture primarily, even though he is also able to practice Western medicine. And what that allows him to do is move back and forth uh, between the language and the approaches Mm -hmm. and the understandings of the two systems. And that helps not only his patients, some of whom may be more familiar with a Western approach and able able to grok better uh, when he's speaking the language of Western science, um, but also to say, oh, this problem that you are presenting with, I think the toolkit that I have from over on the East or over on the West is more appropriate. And yeah. I can go back and forth between them and I can look at any given problem from both from both perspectives. And when those two perspectives align, like one set of methods is likely to be better than the other for any given problem. But when the, when the answers that they produce align with one another, then I have even better reason to think that the answers I've come up with are the right ones. Yeah, yeah. It's also, um, uh, there's a defect in the way we teach science in the West, right? Almost every scientist you talk to will um, be of a mindset that their, their practice of science is a faithless practice, right? And they are confused into thinking that what they know of their field is factual. And the answer is, it is the pursuit of factual knowledge. It is the pursuit of a reduction in the amount of faith that is the core of science. But if you look at even a textbook from when we were in college, and you look at what it says about biology, right? The textbook is not accurate, right? It describes cells, for example, as like a bag of fluid in which these various important compounds diffuse around. And of course, there are some that do, but there's also a whole system of microtubules and molecular motors that take things from one place to another. You know, the textbook says that a gene is the sequence that goes from a start codon to a stop codon and that it makes a single product. We now know that you may get an average of five edits to the thing between the start and the stop codon and that there's a whole system of logic there. And so the point is, If as a scientist, you look at what you think you know, and you say, that is actually a stand-in for what we will ultimately know. Hmm. It's not not an arbitrary stand-in. Hopefully, it's 
true. Hopefully it's not false. Hopefully it's crude and it can be refined rather than being wrong, which is all too often what it actually turns out to be. Mm -hmm. But the very, just the simple recognition that what I know is a model and that there is something real and that what I'm trying to do is push the model closer to the real, right? Mm -hmm. And that that is an increasingly difficult process, but that I'm inherently somewhere midstream within it right? Just even just reminding yourself of that is the key to not being blinded by the textbook, right? It's amazing how frequently the textbook has trained because the picture is so clear and makes so much sense. It's trained you to believe something that isn't even real. And that what you just said is the assumption at the basis of all science, which is there is an objective reality out there. And the scientific method is the best route we've found, wildly inefficient though it is, to getting ever and ever more close to that reality. That's not to say that we will ever get there fully or that we will know when we have gotten there. And that's that's the hubris of the current moment, of any current moment, no matter what moment you live in. You assume you're there. Like this feels like we know more than we did, therefore we must have arrived. But I mean, we've now brought up two of the revolutions in our understanding just in, just in our lifetimes, which is um, epigenetics and microbiome. Right, and you know, those both of those have revolutionized our understanding of of all of life, really, but specifically human health and wellness. And I'm sure there are many, many more, but those are just two that we happen to have ended up talking about here. And at the point, so you know, even at the point that you were young and you know that we were teenagers, we we're a bit older than you. Um, there was no one talking about these things. Right. It seemed it was a much more static understanding of what, you know, yes, okay, evolution, sure. But once you're sort of an adult and your cells are doing what they're doing, you're kind of there. It's like, oh, actually, you're not you're not just one being. You're all of these other bacterial beings as well. And oh, by the way, the editing and the methylation and, you know, all of these things that happens at every gene and almost every tissue of your body at all points throughout your life. That's also true, even though your genome is what your genome is. Like, you're, yes, you're born with it, and yes, your, your, your gametes, your eggs or sperm have something that is static, but all of the possible ways that it can be presented and can, um, can manifest is very much an active process. Yeah, for sure. Here's another interesting phenomenon that's happening. That same person and I'm making a generalization, and this generalization may be true in the specific or not, but in this generalization that I'm, that I'm imagining at the very least, the person with the science is real bumper sticker then is also going to be the most radical proponent of the pregnant man emoji existing on the iPhone. So this seems to be an inherent contradiction yes, it does. Right, to me, where it's like science is real, however, Let's show this image of a pregnant man. <laughs> and, and and then, and this is where, you know, of course you guys have gotten attacked for <laughs> proposing like real science about these yeah. things. But then all of a sudden you just shift one click over and then science is like, no, nah, fuck science. <laughs> like, <laughs> men can get pregnant too. Well, I think it's very strange. It's, it is so strange. And I do think it actually does come back to this idea, you know, do you believe in an objective reality or not? And one step sort of above that is, okay, if objective reality, evolution, yes or no? And of course, most of the people who have the science is real bumper stickers and the pregnant male emojis um, think that they believe believe in evolution, even though they couldn't really tell you what that means. They might be able to trot out a couple of catchphrases, right? But, you know, the fact that we've had, we've been sexually reproducing with two and only two sexes in our lineage alone for at least 500 million years, and it may be closer to 2 billion with a B, you can dress up however you like and act however you like, and that doesn't change the fact of biological sex. It just doesn't. And so it's a conflation of what's in your head and you know, and what's in your head and how you behave is kind of the gender version, but gender follows sex. And are there sometimes mismatches? Sure. But does that change the underlying sex that you are? No, it does not. And that's that's a scientific mm-hmm. proclamation, and it's based on a lot of research and a whole lot of time. I would also point out that 
um, you know, Heather and I spend a fair amount of time on our podcast, probably to the annoyance of our audience, talking about the philosophy of science, <laughs> which is one of these fields that seems kind of dry, like, you know, I think we could just skip and get straight to the science. But no, <laughs> philosophy of science is really important. And you can do something that uses all of the terminology and all of the technology involved in science, something that follows the form. And if you don't get the philosophy of science right, it doesn't work. And what does work mean? Is that some vague thing that we can't possibly define? No, it's perfectly definable. Work means an increase in predictive power. It means being able to explain more and or assume less over time, which means that we do not need to do some deep analysis of what went on inside the CDC during COVID, right? We can God look at help us. <laughs> we can look at CDC and we can say that is a black box. I don't know how it works. Here's what I do know. It didn't predict anything right. Okay? Is it in a position to tell those of us who did predict things correctly to follow the science and to instruct others that they must listen to the CDC and not to those of us who predicted right? No, because what I mean, look, one of two things has to be true. Either what's in that particular black box called CDC isn't science, and that's why it didn't predict anything correctly, or it's science so badly done that it doesn't make any progress, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, if people just simply, you know, in, in thinking about this, science is not what the thing looks like, right? Science can be, you know, uh, a grubby person with no degree in the hills who gets the philosophy part right and can predict things about the world based on their observations, you know, over time. And the person in the lab coat with the glassware and the jargon may not be doing science. They just look like it, right? Well, that, that's perfectly consistent with what we know. The person, the unspecified geographically, culturally, temporally person in the hills, you know, their their life may depend on them being able to actively predict whether this rocky mm -hmm. soil or this sandy soil is more likely to produce the plants that will feed the family from this seed versus this seed. And, you know, whether or not they have the names that Western science has given to those species doesn't matter. And whether or not they um, know exactly when the solstice or the equinox is doesn't matter so long as they can m accurately and with hopefully ever better precision, but most importantly, accurately, understand seasonal change, predict what the weather is meaning about what's gonna happen next, and observe and repeat and observe and hone the predictions about whether or not, you know, seed A grows better in the sandy or rocky or loamy or clayey soil, right? And whereas the person in the lab coat, in the modern environment, Given that it's about getting grants and the grants are about political, you know, political things rather than actually how good are you at predicting, uh, your ability to actually do good predictive science may have nothing to do with whether or not you're able to pay your mortgage. And you know, that tells yeah. you that the incentives are exactly aligned the wrong way. The guy in the hills trying to grow something at a hard scrabble soil in order to feed his family, his life depends on it. He's gonna get it right or else he's not and we're not gonna hear any more from him. The scientists who don't get yeah. it right, we hear a lot more from them because of the way the systems are set up now. Yeah, I hope my affection for the guy in the hills is is clear. Not, not only do I like the grubby guy in the hills, but I've been the grubby guy in the hills. So, <laughs> it, Indeed. I mean, we're in a world now, though, where it's almost like this elitism towards all of the all of the sciences, social sciences alike. Like to be to have a philosophy, you need to have whatever credentials a philosopher has to do science. You need to have all of these credentials to do science. All of these things were just saying, oh, well, how dare you even say that? Or even to talk about to talk about anything to do with race, you must be participating in that race. You can't look from a meta perspective and then offer your own analysis. Everything is like we're excluding. It's this exclusionary model of who can talk about what based upon the credentials they have, which of course sometimes is effective. If the system is working correctly, then these people should be the best of us. But oftentimes they're not only potentially captured, but also potentially entrained in a system that is actually incorrect. And so their entrainment is actually preventing them from reliably getting to the better answer. And so, but we don't, we'd completely disregard that. And anybody without a medical degree like that, like that, I think that bubble has kind of burst a little bit now, but there's still this appeal to this elitist 
elitist kind of idea of, okay, you have the right to talk about this, but everybody else doesn't. And, and I think it's time to really democratize thinking again and say like, okay, let's go back. Let's go back to the old, you know, the old academy here. And let's just, let's just talk about things. Let's make things make sense. How about that? How about we can all sense make? I'll give everybody right now a fucking, fucking master's degree in, in making sense. Go for it. Now, can we all talk, please? Yeah. Well, what you've, I mean, what you've got to do is you've got to purge the system, whatever fraction of the system it is that you want to have that discussion in, of the perverse incentives. If you get the corruption out, then it almost doesn't matter where you start. People will get smarter over time, right? The corruption prevents that process from happening. And um, we are unfortunately in a jaw-dropping moment in which that corruption has taken over essentially every institution. And so people's normal instinct to defer to the experts is now being used against them, right? Those experts are not experts. They say things that are not the result of analysis. And it is so reliable that um, people, if you follow the experts, you will do the wrong thing because the experts are either phony. So how do we do this? How well, how do we do this? How do we, how do we change? How do we turn over? Cause we know now, and I think hopefully we've done a reasonable job establishing the system must change, right? There's problems with the system. System must change. And it's, and the stakes are fucking high, highest, highest they've ever been. Yep. So how do we participate in this revolution of the system? What, what can we do? And what can the people that we elect do potentially, you know, to solve this problem? Well, the first, so, you know, we have a problem at the election level, and this is, um, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but this is why uh, the Unity 2020 proposal was what it was. We have a system that basically trains you in corruption before you get to power, right? You have to demonstrate that you're highly capable of being corrupted before you have any power. And so it should not be a surprise to us that our system is riddled through with uh, people, whether they're happy about it or not. Some of them may be reluctant about being corrupt, but they're good at it, right? Um, so we need to get people into those positions who will actually tell us what we need to know rather than what we want to hear, who will do the right thing, even if it is not the thing that advances their personal cause. Um, that is important. Scientifically speaking, we could look now at the people who did have, you know, a single prediction doesn't do it, but a track record of predicting the future. And we could say, you know what? Uh, Peter McCullough has done an excellent job throughout COVID. He's been way ahead of the so-called other authorities. Let's go to him and let's say, look, to the extent that X, Y, or Z impinges on the functioning of the heart, what do you see? right? What are your concerns? Mm -hmm. What do you think we're more worried about than we need to be? And who else do you trust, right? You could do that. And then you could say, okay, as far as vaccines go, well, Robert Malone is the inventor of this technology, himself vaccinated and vaccine injured. He is telling us that these vaccines are not ready for prime time. My term has been, they are prototypes. Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. I would not be inclined to take a vaccine that Robert Malone hasn't looked at and said this one is based on sound science and the likelihood that it is more beneficial to you than it is harmful uh, is, is high, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that in these cases, we have one or a couple people in a position to play that role, but that is far better than nobody. So what I would say is we could yeah. use predictive power to figure out who's making sense and we could, you know, again, figure out who, who they trust, right? Who makes sense to them. And you can begin to build a system that way. But then, of course, you have to get past the stigma, which is that all of these people have been, uh, have been demonized and derided um, from the same corrupt origins as uh, our, our broken uh, public health authority. And then to get past the stigma, though, we still have to then deal with the the capture and the corruption of our media, which is then driving the narratives that are stigmatizing individuals. Like it was really shocking to me when I brought up the issue of the Canadian truckers, right? And the trucker convoy. And somebody who I thought really 
kind of had a good handle on things and was making sense a lot. It was like, oh yeah, you know, it's just the, uh, they were, they were kind of infiltrated by right-wing Nazi extremists. And I'm like, what? Like, wh- what do you, what do you mean? You know, and it's this very, and, and somehow that narrative was able to, was able to land home. It like landed home. And of course, Putin's trying this as well, calling everybody in Ukraine a Nazi. He's like, oh, he's like looking out to the West, like, oh, what works super good? Well, with the truckers, it worked by calling them Nazis. <laughs> so obviously people hate that. So let's just do that and see if we can get away with this Ukraine thing. And it actually kind of worked a little bit. I mean, I don't know. I don't know who actually is, has Nazi sentimentality or not, but I have my doubts that the world is filled with all of these secret Nazis. I know they do exist, and I know they're the most vile and despicable myth of separation involving participating, you know, violent potentially in their thoughts, if nothing else. I get it, despicable. But nonetheless, there there seem to be these ghosts that we're chasing around, like a modern-day witch hunt that people are throwing around. But it's being fueled by this massive fucking structure that's just like using these cheap dirty low tricks yeah you know so it seems like we have to we have to solve that in order to actually look and appeal to the right authority and then elect people who will you know sponsor the right authorities and it's happening i guess on the local level like the you know ron DeSantis from florida switching out you know getting the surgeon general who's like we're done with fear and i i just love that it was like a, a beautiful moment when i heard him give that speech i was like all right like fucking a and i think that's why you know before this podcast started we were saying that a few states in our union potentially are the freest places in the world because there's at least some flexibility in state governance where we can elect a governor who can then stand for something that's reasonable but it seems like it has to be almost this revolution has to be totalized from media to politics to dissemination of information it has to touch so many different vectors you know, maybe a little bit at the same time. Maybe it's one domino than the other. I don't know. I don't. I don't think in that system's perspective to that depth. But it's, it's interesting. It feels like we're in in a time where it must be like a total total revolution. Yeah. No, I, I agree, and I think I appreciate you bringing up the truckers' convoy. Um, <clears throat> it felt like, it felt for people like us who were paying close attention and who were watching a lot of the. <clears throat> excuse me, the just the live stream footage of people on the ground walking around. Like it was so obvious. And it was also such a hopeful moment. And, you know, after almost two years at the point of, you know, end of January, beginning of February of this year of, of COVID pandemic lockdowns, all of these things to have real honest people with, you know, boots on the ground and skin in the game to say enough we are we are doing this we're going to go and we're going to be honorable and we're going to we're going to protest in the way that we are allowed to that we need to that we are absolutely honor bound to and to have them smeared in the way that they were and to have the the evidence in the form of just i think you know at least tens of hours if not hundreds of hours of live stream footage not just in Ottawa but at Coots and at the at the ambassador bridge as well like three different places along well two at the at the US Canada border and then in Ottawa in the in the national capital of Canada um, which revealed so much relief and humanity and compassion and just just mm-hmm. like you know tears and hugs and and new friendship uh, among a people that even more than in the US have been just separated from one another for uh, mm-hmm. for this in that situation where there was so much actual evidence and still the mainstream media narrative seems to have stuck with a lot of people it really like that was a moment when I had the most hope as, that I've had in a lot of time. And then also like the least, because it felt like, well, if we, yeah, if we can't yeah. win this one, if we can't win this media game, of course we haven't won on, you know, lab leak and, you know, early treatment and vaccine mm-hmm. safety and efficacy and, uh, and, you know, and vitamin D and being outside, and, you know, all of the obvious things, some of which shouldn't be politicized at all. Like with regard to the truckers convoy, the evidence was available to all for everyone and there just weren't any nazis there and yet i think i think there was hope that you know in the arab spring moment for example there was like footage on the ground yeah. and the footage on the ground just went everywhere and everybody's like whoa this is what's really happening yeah. 
you know, and people just accepted that. And, and because there wasn't an, a top down narrative that was debasing, you know, these, the, the actual visual evidence and gaslighting people from what they're actually seeing, then I think there was a hope that social media will actually be the answer here. But in, in classic game theory mode, they were like, oh, I see people have this new tool. Well, we'll just apply another, you know, solution to this new tool and just disclaim the entirety of all this visual evidence. And so now it's like, all right, now in this kind of classic red queen, you know, game that we're playing now, it's like, all right, well, what's our, what's the next move? If visual evidence is no longer sufficient, like, what do we got to do now? Right. Well, in part, what you're dealing with is, again, the corruption at the heart of the dysfunction of our system. The people who decided to stigmatize the trucker convoy with the um, notion of Nazis who didn't appear to exist at all, right? This is something one must never do, right? One does not abuse that particular connection because it is so vital that when it is necessary to invoke it that it is there and fully functional indeed but indeed. the point is oh it's just so useful the fact is who's going to stare down the idea that there's nazis mm -hmm. right nobody you know it's it's a hot potato it, it you know nazis took uh, evil to 11 and so you know to the extent that you think there's a very tiny chance of something that's infinitely bad you know most people don't have the wherewithal to mm. to make the calculation but it is exactly the problem of what's taking place in Ukraine that is why we must not ever do what was done to the trucker convoy, right? Because I don't know, I'm not an expert on Ukraine. I have the sense that there is a Nazi problem or at least a an ethno-nationalist problem with Nazi sympathies there. Am I being played? Maybe. I'm certainly not in a good position to know, but I need sure. to be able to separate the fact that my recent experience knowing that I was being played in the trucker convoy situation is not then predisposing me to miss the fact that there is actually something uh, going on inside of Ukraine, which is that there are sympathies which have persisted there, which are very dangerous. And, um, you know, they may, you know, and they may be abused by by Putin because it's the same useful thing, but it may be predicated on something in this case rather than fiction. Right. It's, an, it's, it's a useful it's, excuse yeah. regardless of whether or not it's based on zero or something. Yeah. And the based on zero or something is nearly impossible to tease out given the information environment we're in. Yeah, the news that cried Nazi is just another... <laughs> update of the boy who cried wolf it is yeah. exactly all of a sudden that. like all of a sudden there's oh shit there's a real wolf there's real nazis here <laughs> yeah. and all of a sudden yeah 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 we've heard wolf a million right. times we've heard nazis a million times and all of a sudden we're not alerted to the actual real danger that exists Absolutely. and that's again this the the hazard that you guys aptly pointed out there that i i think is really landing for me here so as we kind of we're kind of wrapping towards the end there's a bunch of other stuff that i would love to talk to you guys about but i think one of the things that i wanted to kind of wrap up with is it seems that humans have a very potent ability to adapt to serious threats that happen and whether this is a volcano that erupted or whether this is the i think there was the and i don't know what you think about this theory but the genetic bottleneck theory where there's volcanoes erupting and plant life was dying and then people were forced to go to the coast and the the clever of the, the cleverest of them and the most social of them banded together and were able to survive on the coastlines fishing and through these difficult situations and you see it in other examples even in you know sebastian junger's tribe he gives a lot of examples of the blitzkrieg and bombs are falling and shit's going and then there's this emergent thing that happens both in culture potentially epigenetically things come adaptation comes from stress and we're now reaching a point of escalating stress so if you are going to paint the potential the potential for a case for optimism that built in to who we are is something else is going to emerge and be called forth by the dangers that we're experiencing that is going to be you know hyper evolution in 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 kind of preparation for and in response to the hyper threat level that we're experiencing do you think that that's a viable case for optimism to say like all right we inherently have this ability to have something emerge that's greater than what would normally be possible based on acute existential threat like we're facing 100% um, in fact, the way uh, we describe this around our dinner table and sometimes on our podcast is 
that um, one has to pass through what we call an adaptive valley to get mm -hmm. to a higher peak. So the fact that things are very, very bad is not inherently an indicator that they're only going to get worse. It may be that we have to go through this phase to get somewhere. The problem is that the exact thing you point to, the tendency of human beings to put aside their differences and to, to be their best selves in crisis is under threat from a propaganda environment that misleads us as to what the challenge actually is, right? And so we are in some sense in, in a phase of history in which you would expect tremendously high levels of unity and camaraderie based on the seriousness of what we face. And instead what we find is polarization, which is the exact opposite of what you would see, mm -hmm. right? It's what you mm -hmm. see when somebody is manipulating you in order to do their bidding at expense to you. Mm -hmm. And um, what I would say is I hope that people will re re retain enough focus leaving COVID to learn the lesson of it rather than to embrace the relief of changing the topic. Because if you can see what happened during COVID, if you can see who was demonized, who had predictive power, and then you could say, well, what does it say about the system that was in charge of our well-being? And how did that system get upside down, which is really what it was, right? It gave us the inverse mm -hmm. of good advice. How could that possibly have happened? If you answer that question, and you continue to follow the thread, you will encounter the real problem, which is that we have a basic corrupt mode that is now structuring our governance, right? That has to end if we are to move forward. And as difficult a problem as it is now, it only grows more difficult. So now, you know, the best time to deal with it is 20 years ago. The second best time is now, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So we're in that situation. But the hopeful thing, and you know, this is this is the other lesson of where Heather and I have been over the last couple of years, is the huge number of people who have become awakened to the fact mm -hmm. that you can't just simply turn on your television or, you know, uh, go to your mainstream sources and accept what they say as basically right, but that there is a way to do thinking in a crisis like the one we've been facing. That has been. Um, it has been uh, heartwarming and encouraging to see this uh, this sort of new uh, apolitical movement effectively emerge out of nowhere. Yeah, you know your fondness of uh, both of your fondness of George Orwell, and I think comes to mind here. And he almost gave the model for how dystopia and this totalitarian dystopia can come to be, and it is the actual backwardsization of inverse inversion of different truths i mean the the classic from 1984 war is peace freedom is slavery ignorance is strength this is like this is what they're putting out at all times which is flipping our ability to make sense on its head entirely and so instead of the reality like in the blitzkrieg example there's real bombs going off and there's real planes with swastikas dropping those real bombs and there's no way that you can pretend that it's something else and so it naturally causes the adaptation that human beings do best, which is come together, figure it out from a million different perspectives and create an emergent solution mm -hmm. by the bonding and the coming together. But if you insert this divisiveness and start to flip everything and all the sense making upside down where you don't know what the actual bombs are and who the planes are and everything is, is backwards, then it actually prevents that from happening. And you know, so that's the danger and the opportunity of what we're seeing. But it seems like, you know, just to sum it up, like we have to figure out how to avoid that inversion, the upside down world that's being created so that the natural instinct of humans will take hold, which is come together and bond like the movie Independence Day. There's aliens, clearly aliens. There's clearly a spaceship. We can all see it and they're fucking us up. So let's come together, everybody, and figure it out. And, and with a little bit of help from all of us and maybe even some unseen help from a little bit of luck or fortune or whatever other forces you believe in your cosmology, like let's allow that to come through. But we must be, you know, really vigilant of all of this divisiveness and then just allow people to bond together to find the solution to these hyper novel problems. Beautifully said. Very well said. Very well said. I must say I, I, uh, 
I try to be very careful about um, conspiracy theories, but I'm beginning to think Orwell was trying to warn us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I always, I, I feel the same way. You know, I like to, I like to always leave that this is just micro decisions based on self-serving bias and short-term game theory and everybody's and maybe some unconscious system that's built in. I just did a, a podcast with a guy named Fabio Vigi, who isn't an economist by trade. He's a, a professor at the University of Cardiff, and he's looking at how the economic system itself is actually has a set of rules and a set of drivers that if people aren't aware of is actually causing a lot of these actions and so whether somebody is at the top of that being like ha 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 here we go or whether they're just a participating in a system that they just can't see through the lens of that system either way something is happening and you know i think I don't know what's better. I don't know if it's better if there's people who actually are come together and are planning it or if it's emergent. I don't know what the better option is, but I think, you know, at this point we have to be kind of open to looking at, well, one way or another, there's a problem and, you know, we got to figure it out. All right. Well, hopeful note then, um, as between whether it's better to have people consciously colluding or, or an emergent property doing the same work, there will always be a bit of both. But to the extent that some of this is definitely emergent, that gives us the upper hand because those emergent properties are effectively adaptations. And adaptations only work in the circumstances uh, in which they evolved. So the point is, to the extent that the Goliath force that is um, putting us in so much danger is the product of evolution, we can beat Goliath by behaving in a novel way. He won't see it coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And if there are bad faith actors who are colluding, they might be kind of short sighted. Yeah, <laughs> you right. know that that also that also could be true. So let's end let's end with this thread of optimism before we go <laughs> down another rabbit hole, leaving people completely without hope. Uh, because I think it's important to uh, important to hang on to that in these challenging times. I really want to thank you guys so much for the work that you have been doing continue to do your willingness to take arrows to take criticism uh and everything that you're talking about your willingness to acknowledge your wrongs and also not back down from the areas and the things that you know and uh, i think this is an important model for how we can all behave better and help support each other through these challenging times well thank you for that it's really been a pleasure it sure has yeah it has Thank you, everybody. Make sure to tune in to their Dark Horse podcast and all of the other cool gems they have, Patreons and Substacks. I'll put it all in the show notes. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Much love. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere. And leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.